Today's lesson is going to be some revision on the topic of conscience. Remember, for this unit, you have to distinguish between the theological understanding of a conscience and also the perspective from psychology. So it's theology versus psychology in relation to the conscience. The first thing I'd like you to do is pause this video and recap as much as you can um, about St Aquinas and Freud's idea of the conscience. So list as much as you can remember about Aquinas' view and then as much as you can remember about Freud's interpretation of the conscience. The second thing I'd like you to do is to um, recap the key terms that are very important for this topic. So it's important that you have a definition of these following words, ratio, synderesis, conscientia, id, ego, superego and guilt. So pause the video and make sure you've got clear definitions for each of those words. So now you've done um, a very quick consolidation of the things that you already know um, and testing your initial knowledge. We're now going to move on to look in depth at Aquinas's idea of the conscience. So Aquinas um, is um, writing in the 13th century in his work Summa Theologica. And Aquinas does something quite unique with the conscience. He um, moves away from a previous understanding of the conscience simply being the voice of God. And that idea um, was seen in particular with St. Augustine. So for St. Augustine, it was just the voice of God working within us. Now, this view was slightly flawed because it meant that the conscience became um, infallible. The conscience couldn't really be mistaken because if it was literally the voice or the direct voice of God, what happens and why did we have a different conscience? And why did sometimes we get things wrong um, while listening to our conscience? So it raised some interesting problems, um, which Aquinas addresses with his idea of the conscience. Now, it's important that you know that for Aquinas, the conscience is the mind making moral judgments. Um, and this quote from Summer Theologica, you probably need to learn. Because what he is saying is the conscience is not the voice of God. It's not intuition. It's not some sort of special power. Um, but instead, it is us actively making a moral decision. So it's the act rather than a noun. So you're actually doing something. There's a process. And for Aquinas, the idea of reason or ratio is very much tied up with this decision making process. Now, I find that this idea of um, conscience from Aquinas is far more sophisticated um, than um, other theological views. And um, probably um, the most convincing elements are the fact that your conscience is making a decision. So you're weighing something up. And often when you are faced with a moral or ethical dilemma, you do feel like you are thinking things through. You're using reason to think what is the best option um, in, in, in um, the way that we should act in a particular way. Another thing which is particularly strong about Aquinas' view of the conscience is that he says the conscience can be mistaken. Um, and this is found in this idea of ignorance. We see it, different types of ignorance, fallible and um, infallible, invincible, invincible ignorance. Um, and this idea that actually the, the conscience can be mistaken sometimes. That's because we need to train ourselves to use our conscience. It's habit forming. So the fact that it's reliant on reason, the fact it's reliant on a process, um, and also because Aquinas has a way of explaining why the conscience can be mistaken, it makes it quite strong and far more um, convincing to both um, religious people and acceptable to secular um, thinkers um, compared to that of something like St. Augustine, where it's literally this voice of God, this hotline to God. So the first thing that's central to this idea of the conscience for Aquinas is ratio or reason. Um, and for Aquinas, this ability to reason is God-given. It's inborn. It's what makes us human. It makes us distinct from animals. The kind of imago dei, which you find in Genesis 1.26, this idea that we're in this image and likeness of God, is linked for Aquinas to this idea of ratio. So our conscience is connected to reason, and it's reason, this ratio, what we use um, to make a moral decision. 
Now, it's not just about for Aquinas following social norms and rules or cultural norms. We have a duty to listen to this God-given gift and use our ratio. And for Aquinas, our conscience must be followed first. And we see examples with that Jesus himself went against the kind of Pharisees and other social Jewish norms at the time because he thought he was doing something um, right, um, listening to his, his conscience. Uh, we see it in the sort of 20th century with someone like Bonhoeffer, um, who listens to his conscience rather than what was going on around him at the time. So for Aquinas, ratio is absolutely key, the key ingredient to the conscience, because it is that mind making a moral judgment. And it's reason that helps us make that judgment. The second thing um, that's central to Aquinas' idea of the conscience is synderesis, this idea of doing good and avoiding evil. And you've seen this in natural law, Aquinas' natural law. Now, synderesis is again found within every human being. Um, and the opposite to synderesis is something called sensuality. So it's the kind of body and sensual things that could tempt us. And here's an example there from Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve were tempted away um, to disobey God. Now, for Aquinas, he does have quite an optimistic view of humankind. He believes that human beings um, always strive for goodness. And sometimes when we get it wrong, uh, we commit what's known as an apparent good rather than a real good. So apparent good is evil, um, but we don't actually strive actively to do evil, according to um, Aquinas. And remember in natural law, those primary and secondary precepts um, help us um, live our life following a real good rather than an apparent good in order to achieve synderesis. Now, ratio is important um, to cultivate the habit of synderesis. And that idea of cultivate the habit of synderesis is found in um, Summa Theologica. So Aquinas believes that actually we have to train ourselves to do good and avoid evil. We need to work at it. It doesn't just come you know, naturally. We're not just robots. We have to actually have this, and we have free will. We have to make um, the right choices, and we have to train ourselves, review our behaviour, reflect on our behaviour. So synderesis is this process where we are leaning towards goodness rather than following our sensuality. So ratio and reason are crucial in order to achieve synderesis. And finally, we have this idea of conscientia, the conscience. So the conscience is really just the application of ratio to synderesis. So applying reason in order to do good and avoid evil. The mind making a moral judgment by using reason and applying it to do good and avoid evil, synderesis. So it really just means conscientia, conscience in action. So the act of applying ratio to synderesis in order to make a moral decision. It is a verb. You are doing something. You are weighing up a decision. You're making a choice. It is clear the conscience is an act, according to Aquinas. And that's a really nice quote to learn. You are doing something. So I said earlier that one of the convincing things about um, Aquinas' idea of the conscience is the fact that he has um, in his argument some um, evidence for why the conscience can be mistaken. Um, and he explains this quite well. So the conscience is fallible, so it can be mistaken. Um, and this is because we sometimes don't apply ratio to synderesis correctly. So remember, he says we have to train, we have to reflect on our behaviour, it's habit forming. Well, sometimes we end up following sensuality. So we are tempted by the body and we've followed an apparent good rather than a real good. We think we're doing the right thing, but actually we're not. So there's two types of ignorance. The first is invincible ignorance. This is where we're not to blame. So there was factors beyond our control in um, making a decision. We just didn't know. The facts in front of us, we applied ratio to synderesis and maybe we made the wrong decision. But in front of us, all the information, we thought we were doing the right thing. Now this, according to Aquinas, is not your fault. So you should not feel any guilt. The other type of ignorance is vincible ignorance. And this is where you are to blame and you are morally culpable. So um, if you have followed sensuality, um, maybe you convinced yourself you weren't. And for Aquinas, you've not applied ratio to synderesis properly. And therefore, you have not followed your conscience correctly. Um, and this is where you should feel guilt. And guilt almost alerts you to the fact that you've made an error. And you need to reflect. 
And you need to think about some of those um, virtues. Remember the cardinal virtues, especially prudence, good sense. So you're thinking about training yourself um, to, to not behave in this way again. Now Aquinas in Summa Theologica uses the idea of an affair. And he says there's two cases. Imagine somebody uh, meets a, a woman, he becomes his wife, and she becomes his wife and they are happily married, only to discover a few months later that his wife is actually already married, so he is committing adultery. Um, now this is the example of invincible ignorance because the man just didn't know she was married. To all intents and purposes, he thought she was a um, free agent and freely chose to be with him. So in that instance, he should not feel guilty. The second case is where um, someone you know they are married and then you have an affair with them um, and you take them as your own wife. Now for Aquinas, this would be Vincible ignorance. You know what you're doing. You're dominated by sensuality rather than follow applying ratio to synderesis correctly. And therefore you, your guilt is trying to alert you to the fact that you've not used your conscience correctly. Um, and this would be um, this person's moral fault. Okay, so ignorance, both invincible and vincible, is, is a convincing part of Aquinas' um, view of the conscience um, because it explains that the conscience is fallible. And it also, it allows us to think why we might have a differing conscience or why sometimes we act in a different way. Um, maybe we're following an apparent good rather than a real good, maybe sens sensuality rather than synderesis. Or maybe we just need more practice at applying this idea of um, called phrenesis. So this idea of actually this practical application of um, ratio to synderesis. That was just a very quick recap of Aquinas for you. What I'd like you to do is now have a go at practicing developing your argument. Um, and a good way of doing this is saying it verbally. So if you could verbally articulate your line of argument, what do you think of Aquinas? Do you think it's convincing? Do you think it's coherent? Do you think it's well supported? Do you think it's weak or strong and why? So if you can verbally articulate your argument, it helps you really be able to write it down. Um, you may just want to practice this on your own, or it would be great if you could record it on Shobi and upload it and send it to me so I can give you some feedback. So take some time now to verbally articulate your thoughts on Aquinas. Okay, so we have here some strengths and weaknesses of Aquinas just so we can evaluate this theory. I've talked about some of this already, so I won't go over every point, but you can have a read here um, of the strengths and weaknesses. But firstly, because um, Aquinas is so influential in Catholic thought, this is still used, this idea of conscience is still used today by about 1.3 billion Catholics. And according to the Catechism, the conscience formulates its judgment according to reason, just as Aquinas said it does. I've already explained the fact it's much more sophisticated and convincing theological approach to the conscience and why it explains that the conscience can be infallible. Um, it has its authority in, in scripture and also this idea that it links to everybody. Everyone has this ability to reason, according to Aquinas. It's what makes us human, it makes us distinct. Um, some people argue that it could be applied to both um, religious and non-religious people, because although um, there is this idea that God creates this uh, ratio, this gift of ratio in synderesis, um, for non-religious people, they quite like the fact that it's making a moral choice um, and you are, are, are making that decision yourself. Even someone like Sartre would say we have, an existentialist would say we have radical freedom. So we are making those choices ourselves. Now, weakness of this is that actually this could go against the law of a culture or country. So if you are just following, according to Aquinas, you should listen to this conscience first. Well, you might end up, you end up in jail or, or, or killed in some instances. So it's not actually that compatible necessarily with society. And in that sense, you could argue it's not practical. It also assumes that good and evil are the same for everyone, synderesis, so it has a very much absolutist idea of morality. So if you are a relativist or believe in cultural relativism, then this theory just doesn't really work. You could also say it's highly dependent on God because God actually gives you this gift of ratio. He makes us have a distinct nature um, and purpose and this, this idea of synderesis, that's this idea of absolute morality. Um, makes you potentially argue that this is not compatible for secular society or for atheists. It's also highly dependent on reason. Um, and you could say, what about those people that can't reason, like young children or, or are the elderly with things like dementia? Does this mean that actually this, this theory doesn't work for them? Do they not have a conscience? It also rejects the sort of emotional element of making a moral decision. And often when you use your conscience, that feeling of guilt feels heavily emotional. 
um, and personal. So just using reason may seem a little bit robotic and, and too distant and lacking sensitivity. And is there any a time when your conscience um, might actually conflict with reason? You might actually listen to your conscience in a more intuitive sense. Um, and this may mean that you, you aren't doing the most rational thing. Is that, is, that, is that always acting in accordance with sensuality? Sometimes people find their gut intuition when they go against reason. Maybe sometimes it's the right choice, especially in matters of things like the heart and love. So that was just some brief ideas of strengths and weaknesses. What I'd like you to do now is just have a think. Can you um, include any more strengths and weaknesses? So looking back through your notes, can you include any more strengths and weaknesses? OK, it's important just to take a little breather um, there. And what I'd like you to do is um, have a look at this quick recap test. So very quickly, go through those questions. Are you able to answer them? Um, are you happy with what ratio Cinderesis Conscientia means? and the different types of ignorance, and would you be able to identify three strengths and three weaknesses of Aquinas' view of the conscience? So just very quickly jot those answers down now for me and pause the video as you do so. Another thing to do is to include some wider links. Remember, wider links get you into those level six um, knowledge. Um, so what I want you to do is have a look at the following four people from a religious perspective and what they say about the conscience. Um, you will see a summary grid at the end of this video and I've already circulated this work to you. So a really useful grid with all this information. Um, so you should have this at your fingertips. Um, but can you write down the theological position of Augustine, Butler, Newman and Fletcher in situation ethics? What do they all say about the conscience? Remember, all of those support Aquinas because they take a theological view of the conscience. So spend some time making sure you've recapped what each of those say. If you can get some quotes, that would be brilliant. Um, just to add to your wider links, those level six, six level skills. So Freud's idea of the conscience is the, the sense that it's not a thing. Um, it's totally to do with our upbringing. Okay, so we're now moving on to Freud. And Freud takes a psychological view of the conscience. So he's um, writing in the um, 20, early 20th century. And for Freud, the conscience is actually not a thing. And it is not a process and it is not making any moral decision. Instead, the conscience is the product of your upbringing. So your social, economic, religious, um, educative upbringing. So you're the product of your upbringing. So Freud is the kind of father of psychoanalysis and, and psychology. And he believed that every person went through five psychosexual stages the oral, the anal, the phallic, the latent, and the genital stage. And it's the phallic which is most important for his idea of the conscience because it is at this phallic stage that the superego develops. Now, he also says at this time, we start to imitate and copy the same sex parent. So what that means is little boys look to their fathers and little girls look to their mothers, and they try and imitate behaviours and relationships. And he links it slightly bizarrely um, to the Oedipus and Electra complex. So he believed that all um, little boys wanted to sleep with their mothers and kill their fathers because they're trying to replicate that and see the father as a competitive um, figure in the lives for the mother. Um, but really, all you need to know for the conscience is it's at these, uh, we develop in stages and it's that middle stage from the age of about three that we develop the superego. And it's at this point that the superego is fully formed. Now, how he actually does this is he uses cases. So he used to have little cases that he would look at, those case studies. Um, and lots of people have said that these aren't really ethical or scientific, so it wouldn't really stand up now um, as psychological evidence. Um, but often he would have cases where parents would write about their, their children, and, and from that he formed these psychosexual stages. So Freud's idea of the conscience is the, the sense that it's not a thing, um, it's totally to do with our upbringing. And he uses the analogy of the iceberg to illustrate this. So he says there's so much going on below the surface in our minds. There's so much that we just are not aware of um, in, our, in, our, in our minds and memories. Um, so he says there's so much in our unconscious mind. And he says there's three parts to a human personality. The id, the ego and the superego.
And it's like an iceberg because in an iceberg, you only see the surface, but what you don't realize is that that iceberg can go deep, deep within the water for miles and miles and miles. Um, and he's saying that there's so much you're not aware of that's going on beneath the surface of our mind, deep levels and layers of our mind, things that have affected us and impacted us and, and, and impact the way that we behave and feel, and we're just not aware of it. So he uses that idea of the iceberg to explain this unconscious mind and also the three parts of the personality, the id, the ego, and the superego. Okay, so the id is the first part, and this is what develops first. So it's this kind of instinctive part of us. And it's powerful, it's primitive, um, and it links to survival and sensual instincts. It links to base, almost animalistic desires. It's this idea that I want it, and I want it now. It's driven by pleasure and seeks immediate gratification so think a newborn baby a newborn baby wants to be fed it wants to be held it needs a loo you know it might be uncomfortable it might feel unwell it lets you know in a kind of really basic way um, and survival way an instinctive way so this is the id and this is a very very powerful part of our personality so it's this thing that's within us we have these instinctive powerful and primitive things that um, can dominate our decision making now, the second part is known as the ego, and the ego is what tells us what is socially acceptable and what isn't socially acceptable. So our ego learns rules of society. So the it kind of keeps the id in check because our social desires and gratifications, um, it's, it's not always acceptable for those to be um, met. So it's our individual base needs clashing with societal norms and the ego is those societal norms. So it keeps your desires in check and it's things that you learn from your parents, teachers and wider society. It's often referred to as the reality principle. It mediates the id, it weighs up things. So if you are um, hungry, well, it might say, well, wait and then you can eat if you're in a say a lesson or if you need the toilet, you, you don't just go, you wait. Um, and you um, go to the loo when it's acceptable, or you ask to go to the loo. Now, he uses the analogy of the horse and the rider to explain this. So the horse is the id, and the rider is the ego, and the rider has to control the horse, and the reins of the horse, and has to be um, the kind of dominant part over the, the horse um, in order to, to be in control. Otherwise, the horse can just run off. Well, it's the same with the ego and the id. The ego has to be in control of the id, otherwise the id can just take control. And this is why if you are ever um, drunk, um, you might lose inhibitions, you know, you might end up doing things that you regret. Well, that's probably because your ego is being suppressed and your id's taken over, according to Freud. So your good conscience is effective ego over id, um, where desires are achieved whilst avoiding the punishment of society. And it links to the next part, is known as the super ego and i like to think of this as like this kind of moral policeman or moral parent that's inside of you and the super ego is these internalized moral standards what's right and wrong what's learnt from society and your behavior but where the ego is and um, what societal norms are you learn the rules the super ego are those feelings of guilt and shame that you inherit so i have a little boy and he is um just finished being potty trained and um, I noticed this uh, with him um, in the way that this w works because the id will just say he needs the toilet. Society with the ego tells her he must train to go to the toilet in a, in a prep, we can't just go to the loo randomly in the middle of a room, you have to go to um, the bathroom. Um, and the superego are those feelings where when he has made a mistake, the parent has corrected him and say, no, you don't do that. And those feelings of perhaps guilt and shame he's got from being told off in a good way um, that you can't just go to the toilet randomly. You have to go to the, to the bathroom. Um, so it's these internalized moral standards and it links to behaviorism, um, which is another psychological um, view by Skinner. This idea that we are conditioned to behave in a certain way. So we're conditioned from a young age not to behave in a certain way because we don't want to feel these feelings that are super ego ex exhibits, which is guilt and shame. Um, so it's just this internalized moral principles that we've learned from our parents. And this is interesting because it might explain why you may feel guilty about something that your friend doesn't feel guilty about. Probably because you have a different upbringing. Maybe you had slightly stricter parents. Now, the superego is fully developed in that phallic stage. So by the age of five, it's fully developed. 
So one of the kind of weaknesses of Freud is nothing after that really affects your superego, which is deep within your unconscious mind. So some people argue that actually your, your teenage years, your early 20s are just as influential on your decision making in your life. But for Freud, no, it's everything is done by that phallic stage and that imitation of the same sex parent. So you're not discerning right from wrong with this con idea of the conscience. You're not making any choice. It is literally just feelings of guilt and shame, these internalised moral principles that you've inherited from society and societal upbringing found in this superego. And this is a really good quote to use. The superego observes the ego, gives it orders, judges it and threatens it with punishment, exactly as the parent whose place it has taken. So the superego controls the ego and then the ego controls the id. You might be able to find a wider link there with the kind of idea found in Plato's um, concept of the soul with the charioteer. So that there's the three parts and that superego, those feelings of guilt and shame, make you control the ego and then that ego controls the id. And all three parts work together in the unconscious mind um, as, as a part of our personality. OK, what I'd like you to do now is just stop this and have a think about some of the strengths and weaknesses of Freud's argument. What do you like? What don't you like? What are you convinced by? What are you not convinced by? And jot those down, please. So have a look at your own list and then have a look at these um, some bullet points here for strengths and weaknesses. Do you have these um, other things that you're missing? I'll just quickly go over some of the strengths and weaknesses for you. Um, first of all, there is a lot of kind of common consensus that your childhood, especially your early childhood, does have a massive impact in your behaviour um, and how you can um, act in later life, especially with things like relationships and interaction with peers. So that, that idea. And we also see that with later psychologists such as Piaget, um, where we do develop in these stages. So there's this developmental element, which seems to be um, very useful and um, agreed upon in psychology. Now, it also allows for an explanation um, of why we differ um, in terms of our, our moral code and our behaviour, because it's all to do with our upbringing. And we've all had a different upbringing, even siblings. Um, you might have had slightly different experiences that have shaped and moulded you. So this is very compatible with a cultural relativist view, unlike Aquinas's, which had this idea of synderesis with absolute right and wrong. Um, and this idea that actually the importance of your parents in making decisions. Now, this is also very compatible for a secular or atheist view um, because that there's no God or religious idea here. Um, it's all to do with your social upbringing. On the other hand, you can raise some concerns here because this idea of the conscience has nothing to do with making a choice. And what I said earlier, it seems to be that from the age of five, it's completely developed. So what about all those later experiences um, that could have influenced you? It also has some slight, um, these strange implications um, with the sense of that the superego is linked to the phallic stage where you are copying the same sex parent. So what happens if you don't have um, the same sex parent? Does that mean you can't develop? Uh, what happens if you have a more of a modern family or a single family? What happens if you don't have very good parents or immoral parents? Does that mean that you become immoral? Which isn't really the case. Um, and also, if you do something wrong, is it your parents that should be punished for it? So should um, Mr. Dyer or the headmaster of your school or mistress of your school um, get your parents in rather than, um, than you? Should they be punished? So it doesn't quite make sense. Um, also, is your conscience really deep within your unconscious and subconscious mind? Because often when you are faced with a moral dilemma, you are really trying to work it out and process it. Um, and really, is it more than just this feeling of shame and guilt um, or it, is there something is there something a bit more to it? So just some things to consider there. Um, if you've had different points, please add them in um, then I'll add them in here. OK, just like you did for the theological um, section, it's important to include some wider links from psychology. So can I ask that you quickly recap what Piaget from and then the scientific sort of view of Dawkins would say about the conscience? So what do they say about the conscience? Finally, um, have a think about the concept of guilt um, and the comparison between Aquinas and Freud. So remember Aquinas, it's that conscience is the application of ratio to synderesis. Um, and sometimes we follow sensuality and the whole ideas of ignorance. And guilt is almost, almost like an alarm to tell you when you've, you've not behaved well. You need to reflect 
the conscious is habit forming you to train yourself. Where for Freud, guilt is actually found in the superego, and it's those feelings of guilt, guilt and shame. It's something which um, is to do with our conditioning or upbringing. Um, it's nothing to do with trying to correct you if you've made an error, because there's no decision being made for his idea of the conscience. But what is interesting for both Aquinas and Freud is they both agree that you shouldn't um, needlessly um, cling on to guilt. So for Aquinas, for invincible ignorance, when it's not your fault, you shouldn't feel guilty and that can be very damaging for you. And guilt's there to just to help you reassess and move on and learn from your behaviour. Uh, where for Freud, um, he actually says if you get too much guilt, too much shame, your superego is too dominant over the ego and the id, well that can lead to neuroses, it can lead to real problems in this turmoil of guilt and shame, it can lead to psychological and mental problems. Um, so interesting um, that they both agree that guilt can have a negative impact on humans, but coming at it from a very different perspective theologically and psychologically. So make sure you've had a look at the importance of guilt. Okay, final thing to do, um, just to end this revision on conscience, is to have a go at an essay plan. So I'd like you to answer this question. Aquinas' idea of the conscience is more convincing than Freud's. So you're making a comparison between the two. You can bring in wider links from theology and psychology, um, and you really need to think about your line of argument. Which do you think is better and why? Um, you, if you may actually want to write this essay afterwards, um, that, that should take about 40 to 45 minutes. Um, but an essay plan is fine. Um, you also may want to look at the idea of guilt. So Aquinas' idea of um, guilt is more convincing than Freud. So you can bring in guilt into this essay as well. Um, but hopefully this will be useful in just recapping conscience and should give you some really good notes now um, for this topic. Thank you.